verses 1 to 5. John 17, verses 1 to 5. The reading goes as follows. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This is the word of God. Thank you, Seb, very much indeed, and a very warm welcome to you, especially those of you who are with us for the first time this morning. Uh, We're delighted to welcome uh, Trimore and Sylvester, who eventually managed to get here from Zim, and also Graham. It's good to have you with us this morning. Well, do please keep the passage open in front of you, and uh, let's ask for the Lord's help as we look at these verses together. Almighty God says, this is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Heavenly Father, it is no small matter to have your word in our hands this morning. Please help us not to read it casually or carelessly or complacently but rather to read it humbly, reverently, and obediently. For Christ's sake. Amen. Let me ask you, what what is the, the deepest longing of your heart? Or perhaps to put it another way, uh, what goes on between you and God in your private prayer life. I I think for most of us, it's a slightly embarrassing question. I think if you asked me that question, I would be embarrassed as well. But it's also an important question, because someone has said that what a person is before God, that is who they really are. There might be a couple of reasons why we would be embarrassed. Uh, Perhaps for some of us, the honest answer is, well, you know, not much goes on in my private prayer life. It's superficial. um, It's repetitive. It's inconsistent. And uh, secondly, we might be embarrassed because even when we think there is something going on between us and God, you know, I've got a slight suspicion that it's not much like what it ought to be. So I'm embarrassed because I don't pray enough, and I'm embarrassed because I don't always pray what I ought to pray. I do talk to God about things that are really important to me, but I'm not necessarily sure that those things are actually always important to God. Now this morning, and for the next two Sundays, we stand on very holy ground indeed. Uh, We're listening in to the private prayer life of the Son of God. Uh, John chapter 17 is the last sustained, private, intimate prayer prayed by Jesus Christ the night before his crucifixion, and you and I are invited to listen in. It is an extraordinary privilege because John 17 is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Someone has said that this is, quote unquote, the holy of holies in sacred scripture. There are actually only 26 verses in the chapter, 
But uh, one of the Puritans, a guy by the name of Thomas Manton, preached no less than 45 sermons on it. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I'm not going to do that. But we are going to spend three Sunday mornings in it. And we begin today with just the first five verses. I have four headings. And I want to begin with something so obvious that we can easily miss it. And here it is. Jesus prayed. In verse 1, we're told Jesus looked towards heaven and prayed. Why did he pray? I mean, John's gospel would still make sense if he didn't. So let me remind you of the structure of John's gospel. Uh, the first 12 chapters are sometimes called the book of signs, because that's where we find most of the miracles. Then at the end of the book, chapters 18 to 21, they're all about the cross, and that section is called the book of glory. And then in between, in chapters 13 to 17, we see Jesus surrounded by the 11 disciples, the 12 minus Judas Iscariot. And they're in an upper room uh, in Jerusalem. We don't exactly know where it was. Some people say it was over a synagogue. We can't be sure of that. But in those chapters, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. And uh, that section, chapters 13 to 17, is sometimes called the upper room or the upper room discourse, meaning the upper room conversation. Now, in a sense, the story would still work perfectly well if we cut out chapter 17. I mean, we'd still have the record of Jesus preparing his disciples for his departure. We could easily then leapfrog uh, over chapter 17 and go straight into the account of the arrest of Jesus, his death, and so on. So why does Jesus pray? I mean, after all, he's, he's the Son of God. Um, even here in verse 2, he says, the Father has granted him authority over all people. Jesus knows the Father is sovereign, and he knows that what the Father has promised will be done. So if Jesus knows that, why pray? Why pray if God is sovereign, if he's already said in Scripture what he's going to do, and if he's promised to do it? And in particular, why pray if you are Jesus? There are a couple of answers for us to consider before we dive into the prayer itself. And the first is a kind of general answer. Uh, it's the one that goes to the heart of prayer and the life of faith. You see, Jesus prayed because he loved the Father. And because he loved the Father, he wanted and longed for what the Father wants and longs for and has promised to do. Because, and now listen to this, to pray is to line up my longings with the longings of the Father. You see, to pray is not to try and bend the will of an unwilling Father into a direction that is contrary to his nature. No, to pray is to say to God, Father, you've said you're going to do this. You've said that this is the direction of your will and the longing of your heart. And because I love you, I want my will to be brought into line with your will so that I long and pray for what you're longing for. Now that, my friends, is what true prayer is. Prayer is not the presentation of a shopping list of my desires and wants. 
Prayer is the lining up of my desires with his desires in the context of love so that I want what he wants. And in his sovereignty, God answers when his people pray like that. So that is the general answer, if you like, as to why Jesus prayed and why you and I need to pray. Okay? But there's another answer which is more specific to the context here. So please will you notice how verse 1 begins. It begins after Jesus said this. Said what? Well, everything that he said to the disciples in, in chapters 13 to 16. So after Jesus spoke to people about God, chapters 13 to 16, he looked toward heaven and he spoke to God about people. And that was the pattern of his ministry. To speak to people about God and to speak to God about people. And it's really important for us to think about that. Because you see, in the Old Testament, that was actually the pattern of the prophet's ministry. Uh, the great prophets like Abraham and Moses and Amos and Jeremiah, they didn't simply speak to people about God, although, of course, they did do that. They also spoke to God about people. And the pattern of their ministry, which then became the pattern of Jesus' ministry, and then the pattern of the apostles' ministry, was always the word of God and prayer. Later this year, we'll find a striking example of that in Acts chapter 6, where we find that certain responsibilities in the early church were delegated to other people so that the apostles could devote themselves to the word of God and prayer. And if you and I want to be servants of Jesus Christ, you and I need to remember that the pattern of our ministry needs to be the pattern of Jesus' ministry and of the prophets and of the apostles. Because I guess that most of us here this morning are called to speak to people about God. Might be in your family, might be in one-to-one, -one, might be when we're leading home group or the young adults group or kingdom kids. Or for you students, it might be in your fellowship groups down at the college. And I want to say to us this morning that it is dangerous and irresponsible to speak to people about God if we are not at the same time making a habit privately of speaking to God about people. Well, it's not a profound point, but I didn't want to skip over it and assume we all know that Jesus prays, but rather to make sure we know that there are good reasons why Jesus prays, and therefore very good reasons why you and I need to pray as well. Now let's look at the prayer. What does Jesus pray for? Well, in verses 1 to 5, which is our focus this morning, Jesus prays for himself. Next week, we're going to see how he prayed for the 11 disciples. Uh, that's verses 6 to 19. And then the week after that, in verses 20 to 26, we'll see how Jesus prays for all believers in every generation. But he begins the prayer by praying for himself. And he makes only one request. I wonder if you noticed it. Verse 1, glorify your son. And then again in verse 5, glorify me. So our second heading this morning is Jesus prayed to be glorified. 
And by putting it at the beginning and also at the end of the section, it's telling us that's the main point. Jesus makes just one request of the Father. This is the deep, deep longing of his heart. Father, glorify the Son. Now, I wonder how you react to that. Um, I think our instinctive reaction is to say, well, you know what? It makes me feel really rather uncomfortable. It sounds, doesn't it, as if Jesus is praying, Father, puff me up so that everybody will see how important I am. But, of course, this is Jesus we're talking about, so that can't possibly be right. So what does Jesus mean by this? Glory is a really important word in John's Gospel. And it's important to understand that glory is not something that we give to God or to Jesus. No, fundamentally, glory is a revelation of God or of Jesus Christ to us. And the idea is that when the glory of God is revealed, the invisible God becomes more visible to us. So when Jesus is seen in his glory, who he is, um, what he is, becomes visible to the eyes of faith. So glory is about the revelation, or if you prefer, the unveiling of Jesus, so that we see more clearly who he really is. So if you like, when Jesus prays, Father, glorify me, what he's saying is, Father, take away the veil. Because when Jesus was here on earth, his identity was partially hidden. It was veiled. So people only got glimpses now and again of who he really is. And here he's saying, Father, take away the veil so that they can see clearly. An illustration might help us. Uh, imagine someone who is perhaps rather dim. Uh, maybe somebody who sits at the back in science lessons at school or university. That would be me. They've got absolutely no idea what's going on. Imagine you then take that person to a ceremony and they are awarded a Nobel Prize for Science. Now that's a stupid example. But in that example, you are not glorifying them. Why not? Because you're doing something outwardly that doesn't correspond to what they're actually like inwardly. Okay? But if you take some absolutely brilliant scientist and you do put them on the stage and you award them a Nobel Prize for science, that is glorifying them because it is the public recognition of what they're really like. So when Jesus prays, are you tracking with me here? When Jesus prays, glorify me. He's saying, Father, I want people to see me for who I really am. And when you think about it like that, for Jesus, that is not an inappropriate prayer. How is Jesus to be glorified? Well, the clue is there in verse 1, where Jesus says, Father, the time has come. Literally in the original, it reads, the hour has come. And in the Gospel of John, the hour of Jesus, his hour, is a major, major theme. So all the way back at the beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, do you remember Jesus was at a wedding in Cana in Galilee? We're told his hour had not yet come. Then a little bit later on in chapter 7, he's at the Feast of Tabernacles, and again we're told his hour had not yet come. Then again in chapter 8, the authorities try to seize him and arrest him in the temple. They didn't succeed because his hour 
had not yet come. But in chapter 12, verse 33, we're told that at last his hour has come. And it's quite clear from that section, chapter 12, verse 23 to 33, that this is the hour when Jesus is glorified and it's the hour when he goes to the cross. And now in chapter 17, this hour has come, it's upon Jesus. So that in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing precisely what's coming, Jesus prays, save me from this hour. It's the hour when he's going to be lifted up from the earth. It's talking about the hour of his death. So the hour when Jesus is glorified, the hour that Jesus is praying for here, is the cross. Perhaps we can use another illustration here just to make sure we're on message. Imagine a soldier fighting in Ukraine. And this soldier gets uh, awarded a a medal for an act of outstanding bravery in the face of an enemy gun position. His courage is such that he saves the lives of everybody in his platoon. And later, he's awarded a medal. Now, which of those two moments is the most important? Well, the really important moment is when he saves the lives of his men by his bravery. But later, at the medal ceremony, his courage is publicly recognized. Now, again, it's not a perfect illustration, but it's a little bit like that with the Lord Jesus. On the cross, he wins the victory. His glory, his true nature as the obedient son is displayed. But the resurrection on the third day was a little bit like being awarded the medal. Because that was when the victory of the cross was publicly recognized. So when Jesus prays, glorify me, he's praying to be taken to the cross. That's what he's doing. Now, is this a prayer that you and I can pray? I wonder what you think about that question. Well, here's a surprise. There is a sense in which we can. But before you think I've lost the plot and appoint a search committee to look for a new pastor, um, let me try and explain If we are Christian people, then we are sons and daughters of Almighty God. That is who we really are. But that reality is veiled to the world. So if you talk to a non-Christian, they will not recognize that at the core of our being, we are sons and daughters of God. They won't. They will not see it. But here's the interesting thing. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul prays that the whole of creation is longing for the day when the sons and daughters of God are revealed. Because on that day, it'll be plain for everyone to see who the men, women, and children who belong to God's family really are. On that day, there will be no argument about it. The veil will be permanently taken away. Now, of course, the glory that will be ours on that day has got nothing to do with us intrinsically. We haven't earned it. But in a sense, we can, in our private devotions, pray, Father, glorify me, but meaning this, Father, please will you bring me safely to that day when the veil will be removed and the fact that I am in Christ through faith in him will be revealed. So there's a fresh thought for you to take home and pray about in the coming week. Heading number three. 
Jesus prayed to be glorified so that the Father would be glorified in him. That's verse 1, isn't it? Father, glorify your Son. Why? That your Son may glorify you. Now again, this is a tremendous theme in the Gospel of John. What was the driving force in Jesus' life? What kept Jesus going in the face of so much hostility and opposition? Well, it was the longing that the Father would be glorified. To put it simply, Jesus was longing that the invisible God, who made and sustains this world, should be seen for who he is. And friends, there is actually nothing more important in the world, nothing, than that the invisible God should be seen. But again, here's the problem. Most people don't believe that. A friend of mine was having a conversation with a non-Christian neighbour. And uh, this lady uh, had a granddaughter who had been offered a place to study neuroscience at a well-known university. But the granddaughter is a Christian, and in the end, the granddaughter decided not to study neuroscience, but to study theology instead. And uh, my friend's neighbour clearly thought that was an absolutely terrible idea. Now, of course, to study neuroscience and the working of the human mind, that's a tremendous thing. But it's surely a greater thing, isn't it, to study the God who made the human mind. But of course, most people don't believe that. And for the invisible God who made this world and who sustains this world moment by moment to be glorified so that men and women begin to see him and know him, well, there can't be a higher goal than that, can there? That's why Jesus prays that as he is glorified and people begin to see and understand the Lord Jesus, they'll begin to see and understand the Father. Now, here's a question. By what activity on earth does the veil get drawn back? Good question. How does that actually happen? Well, some people will say it happens as you go and walk into a beautiful garden, maybe Kirstenbosch, because it's it's done by admiring the beauty of the created order. I mean, after all, doesn't Psalm 19 say that the heavens declare the glory of God? And the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So as we look at the created order, and Cape Town's a marvellous place to do that, we ought to have some understanding of the God who made the world. But as we look at this marvellous prayer, of the Lord Jesus in John 17, we begin to understand that there's a much deeper and richer revelation of the heartbeat and the character and the nature of God the Father and God the Son. Which brings us to our fourth and final heading, which is that the Father is glorified by the work of giving sinners eternal life. That's the section in between verses 1 and verse 5. So verse 2, come with me to verse 2. Please put your eye on it. Jesus says, For you granted your Son authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now that verse is telling us how the Father and Son are glorified. It's by the Father, to whom everybody on the planet belongs, taking some people, not everybody, giving them to the Son, 
And then the son takes those people who've been entrusted to him by the father and he gives them eternal life. And as the father and the son work together in this way to give eternal life to sinners, the father is seen for who he really is. And that is the heartbeat of God. What is this eternal life that we keep talking about? Well, it's there in verse 3. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, pay attention, because eternal life is not actually what most people think. Eternal life is not talking about the duration of life or the quantity of life that goes on forever. No, eternal life is a quality of life that begins the very moment we become Christians. And it consists in knowing the Father and the Son personally. That's what eternal life is. Personal knowledge of the Father and the Son, not knowing about them, but knowing them personally. And if you cast your mind back to last week, we saw, didn't we, that one of the ways you know that's happened to you is when you're reading your Bible and the Holy Spirit gives you a sense that what you're reading is true and that you find yourself wanting to follow the Lord Jesus. That is a sign that you have personal knowledge of the Father and the Son, that you've got eternal life. And that brings glory to God. It does. The only reason it's possible, of course, is because of what Jesus says in verse 4. Jesus says, I've brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, what's he doing? He's anticipating the work that he's going to complete on the cross the next day. What is the work the Father has given him to do? The work of saving sinners. The work of dying for sinners, rescuing sinners. The work of giving eternal life to those the Father gave to him. That is how the Father is glorified. Now, what is all this teaching us about God the Father? Well, it teaches us, doesn't it, that the the heartbeat, the pulse of God the Father is this longing to bring sinful men and women into his eternal family. That's actually what we mean when we say God is love. That's not kind of a wishy-washy, empty phrase. No, it's God's determination to bring men and women into fellowship with him. And when that happens, the heartbeat, the true nature of God is revealed and God is glorified. So let me paraphrase. Here is the prayer of the Lord Jesus. Father, glorify me. Please take me to the cross. And may it be seen there that you have sent me, that I am your obedient son, and that I've completed the work you gave me to do. For 2,000 years, the church has been telling the world about this crucified saviour. And as we thank God, for the death of Jesus on the cross, the true nature of the Father and Son are revealed and God is glorified. And the invisible God becomes just a little bit more visible at the cross. And the deepest longing in the heart of Jesus is that that will happen. Can I say it ought to be the deepest longing of your heart and mine as well. And when we're praying on our own and nobody else is watching or listening, the longing that drives us should be the longing that the invisible God becomes visible 
and known. I don't know about you, certainly a challenge for me in my own praying. I hope it's a challenge for you in yours as well. So let's pray together that the longings of our hearts will be aligned with God's longings. Let's pray. Well, Lord Jesus, our hearts are truly humbled by this prayer. We confess before you the twistedness and poverty of so much of our own praying. And we ask that by your spirit, the deepest desires of our hearts might more accurately reflect your desires and longings that the world might see the Father and the Son glorified in our lives. And we ask it for Christ our Saviour's sake.